Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't know how we follow that, but that was superb panel. My name is Emmanuel Adu, and I'm your moderator for today. I wanted to start off by introducing um, my co-panelists, and I'll I'll do it in not the order we're sitting in. I'll do it in the order in my book. Um, Andrew. Uh, yes, I'm Andrew Durgi from Republic Crypto. Uh, we're a subsidiary of, of Republic. It's a, a kind of our umbrella corp. But Republic Crypto itself is a vertically integrated uh, crypto investment banking framework, a mixture of funds, advisory, engineering tokenization, exchange relationships, and we have our own token sale platform. Thank you. And, and then Brett? Hi, my name is Brett Morganson. I am the founder of uh, Homium and its CEO. We are digitizing home equity and turning it into a fungible asset class on the blockchain. Thank you, Carlos. Hi, I'm Carlos Domingo. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Securitas, a company in the digital asset security space. So we deal with any digital asset that represents uh, a security, and we have a number of, you know, regulated entities that can, you know, issue, sell, and trade uh, digital assets that represent securities under the U.S. Uh, regulations. Um, Corey. Thank you, Corey Pugh. I'm with Bridge Tower Capital. We are a private equity fund that invests in different companies. And then we also participate in staking and CFI, DeFi, or um, it just so happens. So we have offices in Singapore, Switzerland, US, and Brazil. And uh, last, but by no means least, Ian. Uh, Ian Epstein, the global head of digital assets at the McCore Group. McCore has McCore. Oscar Gross and Churchill Securities in its traditional business and owns Enigma Securities, its wholly owned digital asset business, uh, of which I'm the CEO as well. So thanks, everybody. I'd like to start off by just kind of level setting um, so that we're all on the same page. The audience knows what we're talking about. The topic of the panel, CFI meets DeFi. Um, why don't we just start with a kind of a definition? Right, just kind of first principles. What are we talking about when we talk about DeFi? And I would like to just start with um, Andrew, if I don't mind. Like, just explain what this is, and then you know, follow on with you know what Republic's approach to to DeFi is. I mean, the definition of what is DeFi, I think, could be argued for the entire 32 minutes if we chose to. So I'll probably choose a more broadly accepted definition. Um, which is really the ability for individuals or institutions or entities uh, to uh, be able to leverage a technology stack um, to uh, facilitate the use of certain financial products that do not require a centralized uh, uh, intermediary. So a bank, an exchange, a broker in some instances. Um, you know, if, any of those intermediaries are a centralized product where you're giving up information or, or identity, um, then you're at that point, um, you know, you're no longer a DeFi product. So uh, the ability to interact with products and not have to use those centralized components is what's produced. What we see now is uh, you know, the DeFi space, right? And DeFi has actually been around a long time, um, really since the birth of smart contracts. And I mean, really since day one of Ethereum, everyone's been looking at DeFi as, as how to use it. Um, we had DeFi Summer a little while back, which was really kind of the explosion of, uh, of DeFi into the space, especially and particularly how it relates to Web3 products. Um, but you know, in blockchain, we, we see this all the time. You kind of see a, a new vertical develop, and it grows horizontally very fast, right? So we saw that with DeFi. You're seeing that with NFTs now. And every time there's a new cycle that happens, and DeFi summer was really when you start to see vertical integration take place, um, and start to see products being built on top of other products, and then start to finalize what DeFi really looks like. So I think a lot of that can be accredited, uh, accredited to groups such like Sushi and Uniswap, I think were really kind of the first big instances where we saw DeFi really be deployed on, on a massive scale. And those are decentralized exchanges for, for those who haven't been able to participate in that yet. Um, and then interaction with the Web3 capabilities around with wallet products. And you need both, right, in order to be able to facilitate especially to retails and not just engineers like myself, to be able to participate in DeFi, you need a, a wallet product that isn't overly heavy and that an individual can use, and you need the DeFi aspect and the smart project com component of the actual product. So um, that's kind of my long one <laughs> answer. But yes, if you're using centralized, ex centralized products at all, brokers, exchanges, or uh, um, uh, banks, then you are not a DeFi product. 
And so what's Republic specifically doing to kind of support the kind of environment? Yeah, so Republic is really lends itself to the, the picks and shovels space pretty heavily. Um, we get involved very early with projects, especially from our advisory side uh, and our tokenomics side. Um, so there's a number of DeFi products that we, we have helped roll out now over the past three-ish years. Um, we uh, have a pretty robust engineering team, so we leverage our own engineering resources really to roll out uh, a lot of that DeFi framework. So um, right now, I think more so for us, it's it's still very much on the, the developmental phase and um, on both the exchange and wallet components. Um, but overall, for, for Republic, I think at this point, uh, infrastructure is always going to kind of be at, at the forefront for what we're doing. Just leaning into the infrastructure piece, right? And I think for many who are new to the space, cryptocurrencies, DeFi, it all kind of feels nebulous and kind of odd and kind of switch to Carlos like if I may because I feel like you're building kind of picks and shovels infrastructure bridging traditional to DeFi like just help me and, and the audience understand kind of what needs to happen in order for this thing to really scale so uh, as Andrew said that the pure DeFi definition is something that is completely decentralized and completely anonymous where people connect with a wallet and can you know borrow or lend money or can trade you know tokens and then if you look at traditional uh, you know, financial services, um, it's like the opposite spectrum. It's very, very centralized, it's super regulated, it's primarily geared, many of the services are for you know, institutional investors and not to the rest of the population that don't have access to a lot of the financial products, et cetera. So um, obviously, you know, we want to change traditional financial services and, and give them, make them more accessible and, and you know, reach kind of the long tail of, of users there, but at the same time, you have to understand that for regulators, it's very difficult that they don't do anything about DeFi because at being 100% anonymous, it poses a certain number of problems for investor protection and, and money laundering, which are basically the two things regulators care about, right? Like regulators care about people don't being scammed, and second, you know, your money not ended up in you know, a terrorist organization or you know, some malicious actor, which I guess everybody will agree with, with that topic. So what we think is gonna happen, especially if you follow the, the latest recommendation from the, the financial uh, task force, uh, which is kind of this super regulator that recommends to regulators in the world what to do, is that you know there will be a little bit of you know centralization into DeFi, at least uh, you know to bring KYC uh, and some traceability to the to the transactions. Now, what we think is gonna, it could happen is that it's done in a way that it doesn't actually break the DeFi model. So, if you look at what how Coinbase, for instance, operates, Coinbase operates like a bank, right? So you go there to Coinbase, you have to create an account, you have to pass KYC. AML, uh, et cetera, and then you can access Coinbase services. DeFi is 100% you know, decentralized uh, anonymous. So somewhere in between could be where there's trusted entities, like let's say our company, which is a regulation, so somebody else that has a, a license that we can you know, KYC one wallet and then issue an attestation on the blockchain saying this wallet, it's safe. Uh, it's, it's been attested by us. That way the DeFi protocol can actually continue operating, touching only wallets, but only wallets that are trusted by some, that somebody else has told them like they're trusted wallets. They don't belong to a terrorist organization. They don't belong to somebody that you shouldn't be transacting with. And I think if we achieve that, then we kind of introduce very minimal centralization into DeFi. DeFi can continue operating in a decentralized way for the, mo for the most part, but it will bring a lot more money and assets because people that today are concerned about transacting with bad actors will start being feel comfortable and be and, and transact there. And if you look at the protocols out there, Aave already announced Aave Arc, which is basically along the lines of what I'm describing, and we're participating there. Um, then, you know, all the other automated market makers, et cetera, they're all looking at these kind of solutions because, you know, it's unavoidable that at some point in time, regulators across the, the world at least impose some degree of uh, KYC into wallets. So. so, again, I guess, Leading on from what you just said, which is fantastic, right? So I want to um, I want to get pitched it to Ian this time, right? So I think we all can agree that cryptocurrencies have been really driven largely from a retail perspective to date. Institutions um, last 20, 24 months have started to look at it um, and get involved, certainly on the Bitcoin side. Um, DeFi is a different animal altogether, right? But what needs to happen? I mean, we've been hearing this thing, the institutions are coming, the institutions are coming for like, you know, the last 10 years in, in, in crypto. What needs to happen for institutions uh, to get into DeFi? What, what do we need to pay attention to uh, as that watershed moment? 
So I'll broaden the question a bit. It's going to be difficult for institutions, as Carlos pointed out, to transact directly with DEXs, um, DeFi exchanges, because of know your customer and anti-money laundering regulations. Interestingly, the institutions that are regulated, SEC or otherwise, that are participating can buy the governance tokens with more ease than they can transact themselves. But in looking more broadly about digital assets and DeFi as it extends beyond DEXs to include Web3, the Uber of the future where the drivers own the platform, think like that, it will be easier for institutions to get involved uh, buying those governance tokens and investing in those projects. I think digital assets as we sit here today have a couple pinch points for large institutions. One is custody, how to go about dealing with that. There are a number of good custody solution providers that are starting to develop, but they're not as all-encompassing, certainly, as the Algorand community can attest to. Um, they're not being custodied by many of them. Uh, institutions need to better understand the metrics for investing, how to think about what the right valuation metrics are for these more digitally native uh, assets. And so there's a research component to that. The cell side, we publish on DeFi protocols and respective projects, but many others on the sell side do not. Uh, and so there's an issue of research, there's an issue of custody, and there's an issue of communicating to their LPs, their limited partners, what they're gonna do. And lastly and most importantly, we need more traditional looking financial assets on the blockchain. And I think in this regard, Algorand is in a unique pole position. It will be the issuers that decide which L1s to issue on. Algorand's got a very attractive value proposition for being that L1, as my friend from Homium can attest to. And, um, and I think that's super important. So more custody solutions, more research, more DeFi that's not just DEXs, and more f traditional looking financial assets that these traditional institutions are more comfortable analyzing and investing in. Thanks, that's actually, um, yeah, you ticked all my boxes as well, so pretty cool. Um, actually, you mentioned Brett, so let's just lean into Brett a second. Um, doing my research to be this moderator panel, I looked at your website, uh, you got two um, white papers up there. One about social impact, which I would love to get into personally, but not for this panel. The second one is on, is on DeFi itself. Um, many people in the room probably won't know what Homium is. Maybe you spend a couple of minutes explaining what it is, but I'm particularly interested in how you view uh, Homium as a kind of a stable coin slash DeFi, which is what your white paper talks about. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, we are, I guess, content for the rails. Um, a lot of the panelists here are talking about the infrastructure and the rails that need to exist and where and how institutions will play. Uh, Homium sees the $24 trillion market of home equity, where equity is stuck in sheetrock, land, and framing, and it's custodianed by tens of millions of homeowners uh, who see it as their most important utility asset. And borrowing against that costs money every month and is very difficult for a lot of people. And even in this environment, it's difficult for people to get access to uh, unlocking some of that equity uh, in the form of committing to increased payments. So Homium is looking to commodify that and turn it into a fungible digital asset on the blockchain and provide institutions direct access to home price appreciation through that partnership with homeowners, enabled by the transparency, the immutability of uh, the blockchain. It also is looking at the smart contract to facilitate delivering a security that is regulated and is something institutions are familiar with owning, but owning it in a digital format that can be fungible, it behaves through solutions and partners like Securitize, um, very much like a DeFi asset where it can be traded in real time and it can be settled in real time, but it's actually a security that gives institutions a high degree of comfort. So we see a $24 trillion asset class as enormously large and very capable of providing scale. 
Um, it is backed by home equity managed by home owners, uh, so it has very low levels of volatility. And it has a history of a slow and steady over time melt up. And it is traditionally something people use to hedge against inflation. As a result of all of those things um, and its ability to be immutable, uh, its ability to be fungible, we see that as the potential to be a reserve asset inside of an institutional DeFi environment where all the participants are inside of the KYC AML loop. And we see it as a unique opportunity for institutions to find their way onto the blockchain with a reserve asset where they can buy and hold this as a long duration asset, watch it slowly but surely appreciate in value over time, use it as a mechanic for duration and an interest rate hedge, and at the same time be able to participate um, in the DeFi space as it moves to the institutional layer. And we kind of see it as a friend of mine coined the term uh, future-proofing the digital asset, right? So the whole idea here is to be able to create a shrunken distance between homeowners and institutions, get all of the costs out of the machinery so that the pure amount of home price appreciation has the capacity to inure right up to the institutional shareholder. And um, we're you know, super excited to be a part of this uh, environment and we see this as an evolutionary step in where the market is going and uh, you know we're partnering with and connecting to a lot of the important players that are providing the rails because you need the rails in order for something like Homium to work and the rails need content like Homium that can scale and can be of interest to large-scale institutions uh, that are looking for a way to play on the blockchain. And we're also very excited to be involved with Algorand for all the reasons everybody here has been mentioning. Um, they've worked very diligently and very hard to build a protocol uh, that is custom designed for financial assets like Homium. So um, we think we're in good hands. Thank, thank, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, um, pitch a question to Corey, if you don't mind. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, Corey, that in your investment thesis, in terms of how you invest in terms of the infrastructure, like risk management is kind of front and center. I'd just like to just dig in a little bit in terms of your thesis uh, as you're looking at investments. How do you kind of play that in the CFI, DeFi space? You, you Thanks, Manuel. Yeah, it's interesting backing up. Two years ago, almost to the date, we met two companies, Algorand and Securitize, ironically enough. And we came into this space as a proper private equity firm investigating it and trying to understand it. So we embraced securities right off the bat. And in that process, we started investing in multiple companies. And the companies were really Web 3.0 companies. And we were looking for groups that had viable products, that had the opportunity to um, sell a product, make a difference, and do it right. Fast forward, and then we started to see there was an opportunity for DeFi. One of the things we ran into were the large investment banks. They cannot participate in crypto. They want to. They can't participate in staking. It's an opportunity that comes about. So the regulatory component really put a hedge at where we were going and stopped us. So we started to look around and figure out, okay, is there a hybrid? Is there a CFI, DeFi mix that we could put together and satisfy both? So I think what we're coming in with now is finding a mechanism, which has been spoken about, where the investment banks, the financial institutions, can have confidence in getting involved. And you talked about custody. It starts there. You know, then we have um, actually entered in with our own products. So we started heavily into staking. We've got our own nodes in Switzerland on renewable energy opening up Brazil, and so we started heavily getting involved in that, and we looked at the next step and said, all right, what can we do with them? And so through great partners, you know, Securitize Algorand, we figured out how to take a staked token, turn it into a security, and then you put it in a permission market. A permission market is essentially CFI, right? 
Well, you take those CFIs and you start to create those with layer ones, with different opportunities, and you link them together through a smart contract built properly. So now you've really built a foundational proper infrastructure with custodians, transfer agents that create compliant smart contracts, underlying asset as a token, turned into a security, in a permission market that you start linking together. Now you've got a fully compliant process that an investment bank or a financial institution can look at and they can have confidence. They can dig in, they can scrub it, and we've been able to, uh, really it's through partnerships too. I don't know that there's any one company can do this alone. You've got to partner up with different entities and then we um, exponentially. You, you really believe that, right? That people have got to play in the same sandpit together. Yeah. Well, that's what's been nice about this industry, which was surprising. Um, emerging markets, competition is really not too healthy right off the bat. Partnerships become inevitable, and especially when you go globally. So being in Switzerland and Singapore and the US and over into Brazil, no, you can't be an expert on all the jurisdictions. So. That's a part that I think is um, largely misunderstood too. Not only are there the crypto regulatory rules, but you've got jurisdictional rules in each of these different areas. And the whole premise of the blockchain is to move freely. Well, now you've got to put the infrastructure in there. And so we spend a lot of time on the infrastructure as well. So I think there is a way to merge the two, create the best of both worlds. And it's an evolutionary process that is taking place. I think um, it's a question for everybody. Um, many people would look at, say, Bitcoin and believe that we've already kind of gone through that um, uh, escape velocity. Are, are we there yet with the kind of the broader index? Is it, are we there with DeFi? And if we're not, what is that trigger going to be? What is that moment uh, we can all watch for and make our bets just, just ahead of it? I, I can start with that. I mean, <clears throat> if you just look at the uh, Web2 as a whole and how long it took to roll Web2 out, just globally, and compare that to where Web3 is now, I mean, it's extremely early, like an insanely, insanely early, right? You're saying under 2% right now of Web3 deployment into Web2 products. So uh, I would say that the ceiling is unforeseen, um, and we have a long, long way to go. But there's, it's going to be messy to get there. Um, the different jurisdiction component is huge. I think that's often often forgotten about, and people kind of think you can just kind of skip through it. Not the case. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't even encourage people to try. I think ultimately you want to go the compliant route as you can. Almost everyone on this panel, at least the ones I particularly know, are all pro-compliance and, and, and uh, legal frameworks. Um, and that's not everybody. I was a decentralized purist for a long time. I've been in blockchain 11 years. Uh, I'd say only within the last three years have I really come to the determination that full decentralization's not ready yet, or people aren't ready for it, and we need the stepping stones to get there. And helping to facilitate building those stepping stones and educating the people to use those stones is the only way that we'll find ourselves in like truly decentralized places. Um, from our vantage point, in talking to a lot of the large-scale institutions that are interested in coming onto the blockchain, um, I think they're looking for assets of scale and custody is a big issue. And in a lot of cases, qualified custody is a big issue. And just having custody is not enough. For a lot of these firms that aren't obligated for qualified custody, they use qualified custody as a best practice in their fund management and fund organization. So terminal velocity for this space in my opinion, comes down to when the large-scale institutions get comfortable and are ready to start deploying significant capital into innovative concepts like Homium uh, that begin to pop up all over the place in new and innovative ways as more and more trailblazers on the infrastructure rails level start bringing the pieces together. But it really feels like Custody and qualified custody is a gating item for a lot of very large scale institutions. And it feels like retail is only going to get us so far, and then everything's going to kind of peter out. And until large scale institutions are prepared to start pouring capital in, it's, it, it's going to hit a wall, in my humble opinion. And insurance, too, right? The, the insurance component can't be ignored. Look, is this, this is what we talked about at the beginning, right? So for an institution, 
to come and, and participate into the DeFi, there's no way they're going to risk you know, their business for something that today, realistically speaking, is small, right? Like DeFi is like $100 billion. That's, that's nothing for, even if you capture 1%, that doesn't move the needle for a large financial institution, right? So they're not going to do that unless it's clear that there is no you know, regulatory risks, right? Like if you, if you don't know who you're trading with and you could be trading for all you know with somebody in North Korea, this is not going to touch the asset class, period. And this is why I think Bitcoin today is the only one that has some degree of institutional adoption because it's been around for 10 years. It's considered pretty safe. There's futures approved. You know, there, there is a lot of uh, centralized exchanges that will send you that trace where the Bitcoin came from uh, so you can make sure it's clean and hasn't been used on ransomware, etc. So that's, that's fine. There's a lot of other digital assets and, and products out there that don't have that kind of you know, robustness, and they're never going to be adopted by institutions unless we start introducing those. And um, without trying to replicate traditional financial systems, I think there is somewhere in between where you can enjoy this you know, decentralization with a little bit of centralized touch to provide the, the regulatory compliance that is required. Right? Like we, we like to call that hi-fi, like hybrid finance, where you know, in, in the case of what we do with uh, Rich Tower, with uh, Homium, we are the transfer agent. We have a license with the SEC, and we issue in a smart contract that represents their securities as a centralized transfer agent. But once the smart contract is issued on the blockchain, it acts on its own. It's completely 100% decentralized, and it will guarantee the compliance of, of that security forever and ever without any manual intervention from me and from them and from anybody. So that's kind of the where you know traditional finance meets you know crypto. Uh, and where we can leverage these technologies uh, while still meeting, uh, you know, the regulatory requirements for large financial institutions to be able to buy the, the Homium token or the Bridge Tower Capital token. So. so what I heard there is going to probably raise eyebrows in the audience because what I'm hearing is that banks aren't dead, and the only way this thing grows is when banks get comfortable and inst and regulation is going to be the gating factor. This is like what happened on the internet, like yeah. the traditional, you know, let's say agencies that. Uh, you know, manage advertising, they didn't die, right? Like a part of the, uh, the weight shifted into like Google or Facebook or other Changed. people, but they had to change that. They have to adapt that they have new ways where they could introduce advertising, which were, you know, Google AdWords or things like that. So I think to banks will have to adapt. Some of them will do and, and will still around. Some of them will die, uh, but there will be new players, like let's say whatever, Coinbase or Uniswap, et cetera, or hopefully as well that will emerge right. that will take, you know, some of this new growth into this new you know, more inclusive financial system that we're creating. Well, as we, so go ahead, quick. Sorry, real quick. So a couple points there. Um, quality of product is huge. I mean, we're looking out there and like I said, we started out investing and we've gone slow. There are some amazing products right now. I mean, there are some unbelievable companies coming out, producing things. But when you're creating a product that's a financial product, it's gotta be a meaningful, viable product. And as we've looked at it, if you look at the underlying premise of this entire thing, it's about the blockchain. So we've really focused in on companies particularly paying attention to that. And you know, Carlos talked about it, the regulatory component. I've been amazed at the big investment banks. They want to participate, they'll talk. I mean, we've been working hand in hand with multiple of them and they're trying to solve the same problem. So I don't know that it's necessarily a big sales pitch, it's an engagement process and bringing a group together, vetting it out, and if coming up with solutions, because they're in. Yeah, I see it as a kind of ignition problem, right, that banks have got, and there's also a kind of, it's safety in numbers, and I don't think that maybe some banks have gotten to that point yet, because they've been so used to having sharp elbows, so they have to adopt a new way of working collaboratively. But staying on the topic of like having quality projects, I wanted to just kind of ask Andrew a question, but by the way, um, we've got like six minutes left. I'm gonna ask each of you a question, a crystal ball question, just giving you an advance warning, just so you can start thinking it through. Um, but but while I've got uh, Andrew's focus, I want you to answer the question about use cases, right? We've heard about Homium. Uh, what else is out there that's really interesting uh, that you, you're seeing in this space? Yeah, I think at Republic, we, we sit in a really kind of fortunate crossroads where we get to see just about everything. I mean, we, we are uh, L1 agnostic, uh, although I am an Al Grand Maxi, but we are L1 agnostic overall. Um, and uh, because of the funnel that we have in this kind of investment banking framework of in, from the, our, our fund side and our advisory and, and our token sale platform, we see everything, right? We see who's building what, when it's being deployed, what the effect on the market is six months or a year ahead of time across all the L1s and L2s. 
Um, and because we have that lens, uh, you know, we get to see what's coming, right? And, and I think this leads more into what we were already talking about, which is Web3 products. This is the, the onset of, of Web3 products and the amount of capital that's flowing into specifically targeted Web3 products is enormous. Um, and, and there's a wave. So I would say uh, two pieces from what we're seeing right now. Huge Web3 products and a lot in the social token space. And the social token space, I think, will be probably the next really big push that you see. And what's super fascinating about the social token space is it's something that applies to everybody. It's not very specific necessarily to finance. Um, it's if anyone who's using these social platforms to communicate or engage with their audience or others' audiences or individuals, um, the social token is going to be a fuel and a mechanic to drive that aggressively. Uh, so I'd say between those two things, and some of which actually are, those are paired. So my round robin round, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, I shall start with Carlos at the front. We've got four and a half minutes. You get 60 seconds. Stargaze with me for a second. Crystal ball gaze. What is, what is three to five years? It feels like the velocity of this space, of Web3, is really fast um, as compared to Web2 and whatever. Um, where are we five years from now, three years from now? I think if you compare with the internet, we are probably 1998. Uh, that's more or less where we are in terms of like adoption and in terms of you know the feeling of when you had to connect to internet through a dial-up with a modem and the web will load in 30 minutes and it's pixelated and stuff like that. So I think five years from now, I see two things happening. One is technology being a lot easier to use. I think user experience is still a, a challenge today of moving tokens around with wallets and private keys and stuff like that. So I think that's going to hugely improve and it will be for the most part, transparent that you're using a blockchain and to, to, to transact. Um, and then the second thing that I see is obviously, you know, hopefully more regulatory clarity um, that brings more people into the space, but not only that allows the large institutions to participate, but also kind of like the long tail of capital markets that today don't have good access to financial services that, you know, blockchain can enable, like, you know, the internet enable advertising of, in a very efficient way or, or commerce or, or communications. Thanks. Ian? <coughs> We'll see stable coins that represent certainly the G20 major currencies in the world. They'll have their own respective digital interest rates, which may not be the same as their fiat interest rates. And that's going to be a very interesting moment for the macro investment community. I think many macro funds are starting to prep for that. I think that's something we should all be paying attention to. I think we'll start to see self-issuance from investment grade issuers sovereigns, municipals that have make use of smart contract technology with embedded cat bond type insurance. I think we'll see insurance proliferate across broadly smart contracts and then into more traditional uses. Uh, we'll see antiquated technologies like title insurance or auto leasing wind up being made far more efficient and ubiquitous using this technology. Uh, and I think you will see more creativity amongst equity issuance. We've seen a few examples of that, which have different structures leaning against revenues, leaning against dividend payouts, and doing things a little bit different. And then we'll see the continued growth of DAOs, DAO financing, DAO mergers, um, that will uh, really usher in this Web 3.0 period. And I think there's You just a lot reeled to be off about like that. eight things there, and I could see the faces of like Andrew and Brett paling as they're like, oh, I can't mention that one. I can't mention that one. Oh. <laughs> You're killing them. <laughs> Brett, why don't you go? So, um, uh, you know, I see it through my own myopic lens. And you can't say ditto. <laughs> What's that? I, so, uh, ditto. No. Um, I think the banks begin to wake up. I think the rails begin to mature. I think qualified custody gets resolved. And I think the natural tendencies of the market, once that infrastructure is in place, to surface innovation and creativity where liquidity has never before existed becomes commonplace. And entrepreneurs popping out everywhere with innovative new issuance 
in a security format that rides on these traditional rails that are in essence going to come together, uh, create a very exciting environment where consumers with wallets on their phone are able to begin investing 24 seven in lots of new and innovative stuff in a very safe and comforting way. Um, I, I don't think all of that unfolds in the next five years, but I think we hit terminal velocity and we start to really see um, the rails begin to blossom and the content begin to develop. Go ahead. I agree with everyone that everyone's <laughs> saying on here, but I actually want to use this time to say something else. At five years from now, 16-year-olds will only have existed in a world where Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies existed. That means 16-year-old developers will only have existed in a world where that medium of development and programming has existed. If you want to talk about terminal velocity, think about how every developer at that point will have only existed at that age in that world. Pretty, pretty deep. Why don't you round, why don't you round us out? Yeah, I've got a red light flashing on me, so I'll be quick. I think you had a convergence of three things. Great companies coming in, building legitimate product, number one. Two, you have experts in this field. You know, Securitize, for example. Phenomenal job. The rest of these groups doing it. The investment banks and the financial institutions, they want in. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You put the three together and you've got an opportunity to make something special happen. It's not going anywhere. I couldn't agree with you more. I think um, you know, we are at a really early innings. This is the traditional capital markets is about seven hundred trillion dollars and we're at two trillion of it. And that's like ten percent of that. And that's before we do NFTs and every, all the things that aren't part of that traditional market. That just shows you how early you are. Anyway, we're about a minute over. I wanna thank all of my panelists, co panelists, they've been fantastic. And thank you all as well. Thank you.